one of the questions is a common question, alhamdulillah. But it's a thinking person's question was that um, you mentioned many details rela related to the points of belief that are mentioned. So how do we retain them? And this is an important issue always that the, the notion of classical learning or traditional knowledge or beneficial knowledge, al-ilmu nafi'ah, is that this is knowledge that we need. It's either required for us or recommended for us. And if we need it, then we want to retain it. Because if you know that you know, there's some medicine that you need, it's not very beneficial to know you need it unless you acquire it. Right? So that when the need arises, you have the, the requisite medicine. Of course, having it and not using it is also not useful. Right? Because you need to have the medicine to know what treatment to pursue. But you also, um, you, you also um, need to then use the medicine because otherwise it won't benefit you. So both things need to be true, right? We need to have the medicine. And the, the key to that is that one has to treat Islamic knowledge differently from many other types of knowledge that one studies, where one studies for a test or an exam. Right? Rather, right here, one studies in order to retain. That one should have a notion of what is beneficial knowledge. And if it's worth studying, it's worth retaining. Particularly the the outward Islamic sciences, right? That you need, you know, you simply need to know it. Um, so when it comes to Islamic beliefs, for example, you know, these are points that we we want, we need to know in order so they that they have the, the desired salvific effect, which is that we live the meanings of this, you know, of these beliefs. And that we respond when tested, either inwardly, when thoughts arise, when questions arise within, or outwardly, when issues arise around us, that we can respond through the, through the light of faith. So for, for doing this, um, one has to have some method, some plan of retaining knowledge. And the key to that is that, properly speaking, if one's taking any subject seriously, one would prepare in advance. There's three steps that the Mashaykh mentioned, which is you prepare in advance before a class. In the class, you listen attentively. In the class, you listen attentively. And after the class, you review. These are the three simple steps. Before the class, you prepare. They said even five minutes of preparation have a tremendous impact. Normally, the texts that we cover are not extensive, especially, for example, level one, etc. And we provide the text. So even if you just read the text before, you'll find significant benefit before coming to a class. But the ideal case is that one takes notes in advance of a class. Right? So one breaks down what one's studying. So one writes out the text, sees, okay, what are the questions that I have? Right? And there's basically four fundamental questions related to anything, which are what, why, how. And there's certain things where a fourth question arises, which is when. So one asks, what is it? Why is it important? How do I implement this? And certain things relate to when. Right? Like when do I do Salat al hajj for example. So to the extent that one can get ready before, and one 
a sign that one is prepared is that one has questions because this knowledge, even the knowledge of beliefs is meant to be acted upon, whether inwardly or outwardly. And the most important question is that as the ulama said, that knowledge calls you to act upon it on its levels. Some knowledge is practiced day to day outwardly. You learn how to pray in accordance with the sunnah, then you act on it on an ongoing basis. There's some other knowledge that you act upon conditionally, that something happens, so this is what you do. That you learn how to do Salat al tawbah so you know when you do it. When you want to make tawbah, this is an optimal way of making tawbah, is Salat al tawbah There's other knowledge that is acted upon inwardly. That you train yourself to think in accordance with your iman. And that's why we're studying aqidah. We're not studying aqidah as a mere intellectual exercise. We're not studying aqidah in order to be able to debate with other sects or groups, etc. No. But rather, we're studying mainstream aqidah in order that we can look at the world, look at existence through a consciousness illumined by our beliefs. So that's the that's before class, one prepares, one has one's question, how do I, the most important question, how do I live this? How do I practice this? Either in general or particular issues arise. Then okay, what is it? Sometimes it won't be clear. So you want to make sure you got what is it? Why is it important? How do I practice this? Or sometimes a particular question may, issue may arise. That okay, what do I do? I was a little bit late for class today because the, the taxi driver is Syrian and you know, they've had a, a few challenges in not just recently but for, for decades. And so he had a number of questions and he asked, is this jinn? Is this this and that? And probably not. Right? But how do we view difficulties and distresses in our life? We view them through the lens of Iman. Right? Why do we study about what is, um, what is our beliefs? What are our beliefs? Because this is how We view the world. Why do we view what we believe about the Quran? Because this is how we should look at the Quran. So in the Islamic beliefs you know, is the science of looking. Right? Is the science of looking. Right? How do you look at reality? Both the necessary reality, which is Allah Himself, and the contingent reality, which is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's creation. And um, so, this is where you know it's important to have a plan before class of preparing. Ideally, you would take even skeletal notes. Then in class, one of the important skills that one acquires is how, how does one take good notes? Because one wants to retain this. And in that, one should have questions ready. Even if you're in a real rush, even two minutes, or the teacher does a long opening dua, even in that time, okay, what are questions that I have? And you know, they say, fake it till you make it. If you don't have questions, make up some questions. But they should be meaningful. There's one brother, he came, when I was living in Jordan, he came to Jordan and asked, how do I benefit from the Sheikh? I said, ask questions. He, of course, he overdid it. After every single prayer, he'd walk up to our Sheikh and would go, Sheikh, I have a question. And sometimes the, you know, the Sheikh would stop and he'd be looking at the Sheikh and be like, um, well, um, I wanted to ask about, um, well, 
And then I asked him, are you making these questions up on the spot? Yeah, you told me to ask questions. I said, but not necessarily after every single prayer, right? Um, he said, but you said that that's how you benefit. I said, but doesn't mean all the time. But one should, the question that one questions that one has, one should ask them. But then the review process is very important. Right? To review one's one's notes, but also to review, okay, what questions do I have with that? Right? And that that aspect of reviewing. So those are two skills that, well, there's three. How one prepares for a class, one should have a plan. This is how I prepare for a class. And just as if you put in your schedule, attend class, you should put in your schedule, prepare for class. Number two is attending the class, and the key to that is being attentive. There's adab, proper manners of, of um, seeking knowledge. All of them revolve around one reality. That one reality is attentiveness. Because if you are attentive, you will benefit. If not, then probably not. And then after attending attentively, taking notes, asking your questions, and to be attentive, cutting out distractions to the extent possible. And distraction is from disrespect of knowledge. If you can't listen to Islamic knowledge with attention, don't. Because the key to benefit is respect and reverence, ta'zim. And if you can't have that respect and reverence in the, in, in the class, it's better not to listen to it. It's better not to listen to it. It's better just to relax than to listen disrespectfully. So, so those are th those are the three elements, and one reviews after class, but ideally before the next class, review what you've taken so far to do a quick review. Because sometimes what you learn in lesson three may raise questions about what you'd studied earlier in lesson one and two. Then what you study in lesson four may actually, because things start coming together, may raise questions about earlier things. So that's, that helps you retain the knowledge, but also makes it more meaningful. It is only normally possible to sustain something if it is meaningful. If it is meaningful. So those are a few of the things to, you know, to retain one's knowledge. And there's a long lost, um, not long lost, but very neglected aspect of Islamic learning, which is collaborative learning, to have people, to partner up with someone in one's learning. Or, and that even online, those of you who are following online, even through the, the forums, etc., to raise questions there, that in lesson two, I found this beneficial. I had, you know, um, where can I read more about this, etc. So. You know, to, that act of being active with the knowledge um, benefits. In some societies, actually, in some, um, even recently, what they would do is before the teacher taught the lesson, the students would gather and they would deliver the lesson. So, for example, uh, Abdul Rahman delivers the lesson and the other students listen and they ask him questions. And they sort of do a pre-lesson, and they'd rotate who's delivering the lesson. So they would know, have a good sense what they understood, so they would confirm their understanding, and what they didn't, so they would ask questions about. But also to have group review sessions. So that's how, um, that's how one consolidates one's knowledge. Um, um, and it's also important to, to ha have purpose. Why am I studying this? Right? So the believer should not do anything without purpose. Right? 
the, the Sahaba, the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba, when they're building the masjid and also when they're building the trench, they chanted this poetry, Allahumma lawla anta mahtadayna. O oh Allah, were it not for you, we would not have been guided. Wala tasaddaqna, wala salayna. We would not have given charity nor prayed. Right? That it were it not for you, we would not have prayed. Right? Because all of it only makes sense for the ultimate purpose. Iyaka na'bud. It is for you alone. It is you alone that we are devoted to. So the acts of devotion from which is seeking knowledge. And likewise, anything else one does in life, it only makes sense if the purpose is clear. So how are you seeking Allah through this thing that you do? Other things, ignore it. You went on YouTube to, to see how to use your new gadget and this video popped up. Do you have any clear purpose while you're listening to an Islamic video about whatever? No. Give it a miss. Right? Actually, having fewer stimuli is, is better than just busying yourself with a lot of religious drifting without any real purpose behind it. Do less. It, we, in, we recently had a seminar on um, the um, on the Book of Knowledge from Imam Bukhari's Sahih. And people came to Sayyidina. People came to, to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and asked to study daily. And he refused. They asked if they can study twice a week. Uh, every other day. He refused. They said, what about three times a week? He refused. He said, I'll teach you once a week because that's what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to do. Right? So, and of course, that's not an absolute thing. You can only study once a week, but and this is applied to people who are busy with their worldly lives, that you take the amount that will be a means of benefit. Otherwise, relax. Right? Relax and live your religion. Right? That's what the knowledge is about. So there's another question that, uh, would there also be opportunities to ask questions during the virtual office hours? Yes, we have virtual office hours. Do book the, the, the time, inshallah. Um, I had trouble adjusting to the office hours, so some of my office hours didn't happen. So I apologize. I've tried to apologize to a mischief couple. But, and we have other teachers, Sheikh Abdul Rahim Riyasat and others who are also doing the office hours. But the office hours are primarily for advice on, on you know, sort of mentorship for you know, in one's seeking knowledge, not specifically about. If, if you have questions, we have the answer. We have the, if they're, Course specific, you can ask questions in the you know at the end of the lesson, or in the class forums. That's the ideal place to ask them. Um, and most questions, you know, and one one way even if it's an embarrassing question, one can ask indirectly. That if this if if someone was thinking this, what's the answer? Or someone was wondering, you could be that someone, right? And you know, no one really, no one really cares. I'd say now Ali ibn Abi Talib had some private questions and he was embarrassed to ask directly because he was married to the daughter of Rasulullah. So he went with one of the companions and they asked the question on Sayyidina Ali's behalf. But then, because they had a duty to preserve knowledge, they mentioned that this is what took place. So we could learn from that. Alhamdulillah. Any other questions before we begin? Bismillah. <laughs> 